very reassuring. Okay, and let's move on. He was an associate at Paul Weiss in New York, et cetera. You get the picture. Worked for Bill Clinton, worked his way up, blah, blah, blah. Obama loved him so much, he made him the head of the Department of Homeland Security where he's done a, a knock-up job, just the greatest job in the world. Fantastic job. Wonderful Democrat liberal. Just what you'd expect. Disappears after a terrorist attack and then tells us not to say the, the wrong thing about Muslims. So, okay, here we are. So, so who is ISIS? I started to, to get that early. The best I could figure it out, this is a direct result of Obama withdrawing troops from Iraq prematurely when his general said, don't withdraw all American troops from Iraq because you're going to create a power vacuum. It's exactly what happened. So Obama owns ISIS. He created them by taking all our troops out after they had died and been maimed, subduing and pacifying the Sunni triangle. Remember the Sunni triangle in the heyday of the Iraq war? This is now the cancer, the center of the cancer. All of these cities, Raqqa, all of these are in the Sunni Triangle. Ask Marines and Rangers and common soldiers who fought there what a hellhole it is, how they treat women and children. Ask them what they saw. They were subdued. Obama said, now let's all leave Iraq and we'll all get along. Well, okay, he owns this. So these are Saddam Hussein's, the best I can figure out, extremely experienced, murderous, uh, revolutionary guard. Do you remember when Bush went into Iraq, what happened? Remember he stopped at a certain point and people argued whether he should arrest or kill all of the members of the Iraq Revolutionary Guard. Remember that discussion? Well, here we are. The cancer is back. These are some of the worst murderers on, not some, they are the worst murderers on the planet. They're all trained in Saddam Hussein's army. And now they're spreading like a cancer around the world because we have no real opposition in the West. We have weaklings and corrupt politicians. And they know it. They know it. They know that we have corruption and weakness in the West. They know how the countries are run by corrupt, weak liberals. That's how they're functioning. Back Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. <laughs> I made one mistake in the last uh, part of my monologue. It just came to me. I'm just so distracted right now. I was talking about the Sunni Triangle being the center of this cancer of radical Islam, meaning ISIS right now. And I'm correct. But when I said Raqqa, I should have mentioned Raqqa is in Syria, not in, in Iraq. Nevertheless, that's irrelevant. What's relevant here is that these are battle-trained military officers behind ISIS. And what's shocking to me is that these are the very people that Saddam Hussein kept under control. So you could blame Bush for this as well if you want, by the way. You can blame Bush if you want. We have two morons in a row. Eight years of that moron, now seven years of this idiot. Fifteen years, how much longer can the West survive if this is the best we can do in the West, is elect idiots like this? I mean, Bush, you can blame him for this too if you want. Okay, but what's the point of blaming anybody? It comes down to what are we going to do about it? Now we all say Second Amendment like we're all tough guys. Everyone's a tough guy. Everyone has a gun and they sit in home and they come near me, I'll kill them. I've heard it all. We don't know how many of us will actually be able to use a gun if you are approached by it. Ask people who actually use guns how many people freeze up when the time comes to actually defend themselves. They freeze. They turn white with fear. And they either drop the weapon or shoot themselves in the foot. I mean, be real about it. Everyone could be a tough guy in their bedroom with a loaded gun or go to a shooting range and shoot a paper target. Ask men who've been in combat or ask police who've been in, sh in shootouts what it's like to actually shoot back when you're being shot at. That's number two. So don't assume that because you have a gun, you're going to defend yourself. I'm glad you have a gun. Very good. It gives you a sense of confidence and unto itself, that's nice. Wonderful. But that's not going to be enough. A government is supposed to protect you from even having to think about that. But because we have a quizzling government, we're all worried. Isn't that the real reason we're even having this discussion? Aren't we all worried that this guy is either too weak or too much of an academic liberal 
or uh, so wed to the ideology of his uh, the doxies of liberalism that he can't protect us. That's the nice view of Obama, that he's just a diehard liberal and a university type and very pensive and uh, thinks things through, not allowed. And that's why uh, he does these things all the way uh, across the spectrum. He does it because uh, he's on their side. I've heard it all. At the end of the day, we don't know what to do. That's why we're even talking about it. If we had a vigorous leader like Putin or Trump, let's say, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. We'd be in the streets cheering on television sets as we see their buildings going up in, in smoke. You remember the early days of the Iraq war, how we all watched television? The days of shock and awe, where there was that campaign run by General Schwarzkopf. God, where is he now that we need him? Where is there one general we can all rally behind who goes on television, shows us pictures of their command and control centers and their ammo dumps and their training camps being destroyed in a bombing campaign, a 72-hour campaign, and then the tanks go in and crush them? Where is that? Where is that? Now, here's the thing to worry about. The very thing that these psychos want is to draw us back into another ground war. You do know that. I hope you understand that that is, is Obama's uh, uh, conundrum. He knows that as well as I do and as well as you do. He's trapped in a way. So he's very cautious. Let's take the, the, um, the nice view of Obama, that he's not really one of the uh, bad ones. He's just simply an academic liberal who wants to be as peaceful as he can and still get the job done. He doesn't want to overdo it. He doesn't want to escalate to nukes, for example. He doesn't want to send in ground troops. He doesn't want to send in heavy bombers. He wants to send in an occasional, you know, uh, plane and then have them not even drop bombs. Make it look like he's doing something. It's not because he doesn't want them wiped out, but he's so afraid of collateral damage that he doesn't even send the planes to do their job. That, that's the nice view. Well, I don't know if it's the correct view, though. Nor does it really matter. What we really need is someone to bomb them so they're no, no longer there. If they've taken over a city like Raqqa, so there's a logical answer. I'm afraid it's a logical answer, and it's a horrible thing to say. It's called collateral damage. They hide behind women and children anyway. You well know that. That's just the stock and trade of these people. They hide behind women and children. They use them as human shields. Harry Truman faced the same problem with Japan. FDR and then Harry Truman faced the same problem with Germany. Do you think they wanted to burn every child alive in Dresden? You think they wanted to kill every old woman and every German child when they firebombed Dresden? No, but they firebombed Dresden. Horrible thing to witness. Of course, you don't hear about the firebombing of London that went on endlessly by the Nazis. All you hear about from the liberal uh, the academics is the firebombing of Dresden and how bad we were. Or then you hear about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as horrendous as it was. That's all you hear about. You hear nothing about what Japan did, nor what Japan would do, nor what Japan was trying to do. All you hear about is, is, is Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we're a racist, genocidal nation. That's the liberal mantra that your daughter is being taught in your sick universities. We're going to have to have a wartime consigliore during a time of war. Right now, we have Frito running America. We have Frito running America, not the Don himself, and we're looking for the Don. Where is this Don? I could play the Frito tape, but that'll take too much to even say it. I'll lose my voice if I have to call for it, so I won't. Okay, so we have a Second Amendment. We're all happy. We're all John Wayne. We're all John Wayne in our pajamas at night. Everyone's playing with their gun. Everyone's oiling it. Let that guy come, I, I'll blow him away. Blah, blah, blah. Everyone's a tough guy. It's like everybody's a great lover in their own mind. Everyone's a great warrior in their own mind. But none of us know how we're going to actually behave uh, in either of those acts until we're in them, <laughs> until we're in that situation. That's the absolute truth. You ask guys in combat, they'll tell you some guys who you think are kind of wimpy turn out to be ferocious warriors, and guys who look like they play the part of central casting hero Freeze up, and they can't do the job. I mean, we don't know. You can't tell by looking at someone how they're going to react, incidentally, either in bed or in warfare. Ask the women about that one. <laughs> I'm trying to lighten this thing up a little bit because I don't want to just stay on a, on, a, on, a mono, on a monorail here. And so we don't really know how we're going to act. So what do you do in a time like this? How do you encourage yourself to not be afraid of these animals? What do you do? I can give you some techniques, some real easy ones. Many of you are scared to death right now. You're afraid that they're going to be in your neighborhood or in your, in your bakery or in your supermarket. And given that we have academic fools running everything, it could happen. 
They've even told you this is the new normal. You expect a bomb in your daughter's preschool. What the heck? Go ahead. Walk away cocktail. Nothing to see here. Uh, the Prez has to run off to the uh, Lincoln Center right after his big speech. After uh, Alfred E. Newman gave his speech, he ran to the Lincoln Center to congratulate himself with Steven Spielberg. Or the other moron, George Lucas. That's right. Last night he, he had to celebrate with George Lucas. Right after the speech, had to dash off to the theater. So people are afraid. They don't know what to do. So they lock their doors. They got the gun if they can have one in the state that they're in. And they try to make the best of it that they can. They try to keep their mind off it or else they could go crazy. You can go nuts. You can scare yourself to death with anything, by the way. And you can't let that happen. So what techniques can you use? I can give you some. I'll give you, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch to make yourself feel stronger. I don't care if you're an 80-year-old woman. The next time you fear a Muslim terrorist blowing you up, go and do five push-ups and think how strong you are. How do you like that? It starts with the individual. How do you like? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? You haven't read that yet. You haven't seen it on ABC, CBS, or NBC. Every American has to strengthen himself. Every American has to make themselves stronger right now and not depend upon these morons in the government. Don't count on them because they failed you before and they're going to fail you again. And so whether or not you own a gun is almost irrelevant. What matters is that you feel strong inside, and you've got to make yourself stronger inside. You've got to toughen your mind and toughen your body. And that's one little technique. I'm giving you a baby technique. You feel frightened? Go and do five push-ups. Go run around the block. Go walk around the block. Go feel how strong you are. Stop being so afraid of everything. That's number one. Number two, and this can only apply to individuals who actually have it in their, in their ancestry, how do you face a thing like this on a daily basis? Well, for one, you have to put it in context. Unless you are personally injured by one of these uh, psychos psychotics, or unless you know somebody who was, it's very remote. It's not even real to you. So you say, ah, you know what? It's going to happen or it's not going to happen to me. And if it does, what can I do about it? That's called a fatalistic approach. And the Israelis live with that, by the way. They have a kind of existential reality that they have put a wall up between them and the murderers in the Palestinian territories, and they're going to live the best that they can. They still have babies. They still have weddings. They still have bar mitzvahs. They still play music. They still create great art. They have a great electronics industry. They have a great technology industry, and they don't let the animals drag them down into the first century. So you can't let the animals drag you down into the first century. You're never going to bring them up. Never. See, the liberal view is is that if you treat them well and you treat them nicely, they'll, they'll come to understand and appreciate Western values. That's not how it works. Never worked that way, never will. The barbarians will never become a modern man. Never. Never. They seethe with hatred for everything you have and everything you say and everything you do. And they're just waiting to cause harm. The barbarians, they are. And so you have to function in a kind of almost duality, which is, it's not going to happen to me, and if it does, what can I do about it? I'll protect myself the best way I can and go on with your life. Then there's a third way, and this is what I use. I've used this my whole life. Whenever I get down, I start to think I can't take this anymore. I can't take radio. It's dealing with a cancer on a daily basis. I've done it for 21 years. I'm a very successful author. I'm a successful broadcaster. What am I doing this for? Some days I ask myself, why do I need to be on the firing line? And I say to myself, you know, this is nothing. This is nothing. It's petty. You're not really suffering. It's nothing. You want suffering? Go and take a look at what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust, and you'll see suffering. And you'll see, how about those guys who went into the woods and joined the Russians and joined partisan units and fought the Nazis literally with sticks and stones till they stole their weapons, and they were warriors their entire life in the woods? How did they do that after seeing their families slaughtered? I was reading last night about a group from Belarus in Russia, Minsk. Minsk, an area of Minsk, that when the Nazis conquered Minsk, they did things that would make ISIS look like angels. They took Jewish children and threw them to, to dogs. Wild dogs, they threw little babies in front of their mothers to dogs and watched them eat the children, ripped them apart, and they made the Jewish families watch this. You have no idea how the depths to which human beings can go with evil. You haven't any, we have some idea, rather, with ISIS, but they're not even the lowest of the low. It's happened before in history. It's happening now, and it'll happen again. So you, you hear these stories. I was watching a TV show last night about... The resistance fighters of Minsk, that after the city was 
leveled like this, where they hunted down every Jew and killed him or deported them, whatever they did. They 